and you're live. All right, welcome Zoom followers. I'm going to give it a second so folks can actually jump on and attend this live session. Scotland Kiefer already in the house, that's impressive. Uh, Julie Fogarty, hello. Uh, we're gonna give folks uh, about uh, 10 seconds before we kind of jump into some things. We have a jam-packed show for you tonight with a whole host of guests. Uh, actually, we only have two guests and you can see them right now. So uh, hang on, we're gonna get with them in a second. Uh, one thing I did wanna bring everyone's attention to because several folks have asked us you know, what is going on with the fires? What's happening out there? Uh, should I go out and visit uh, Sonoma, Napa? What, what, what do I need to be doing? And absolutely, you should still be going. So let me bring you up to see speed on what's happening with the fires as it relates to kind of the wine region that we are famous for, know and love. So I'm going to jump to Google Earth, Jeff and Jane Greasy. Hello, Nelson Holden. Hello. And I'm going to see some nods when you can see the screen. And this gives you a little bit of a zoomed in approach to North Valley, Napa, St. Elena. Further up Valley is Calistoga. So the glass fire started over here in the Howell Mountain Range area. And it quickly jumped over and ran up to Spring Mountain. And then in Spring Mountain, it ran at a light speed pace and did significant damage on Spring Mountain. Cane Mountain Vineyards, one of our favorite places that we've had the pleasure of staying at. Uh, lost all their housing. Schweiger is okay. Terra Valentine lost their rooftop housing. A lot of damage. Right now, the glass fire is 6% contained. 437 structures in Napa have been destroyed, 150 in Sonoma. Currently, there's 29,000 structures at risk. So it is a very, very fast moving fire. Both St. Helena and Calistoga are under mandatory evacuation. And if I pan out a little bit, because the fire has actually jumped and gone down onto the Santa Rosa side as well, still burning very prolifically on the east side of the valley and up towards Calistoga. Out on the outskirts of Calistoga, the fire has destroyed Auberge, uh, the Calistoga Ranch. South of here is kind of where it peters out. So if you are heading to wine country, and I strongly encourage you to do that, Yountville South, for the most part, is fine. And Sonoma, for the most part, southern portion of Sonoma is fine, and northern portion of Sonoma is fine. And that's important because our two guests this evening are in the far northern portion of Sonoma. And for those of you that are, are joining, Jan Kiefer, hello. Uh, thank you. And I believe we are now live on Facebook. You will have to wait to the commercial break for us to catch you up. And, and Steve and Brian, there's no commercials. This is just a live show. We just make stuff up along the way because it's just wine. But uh, Cellar Angels are here for your wine enjoyment. And actually to introduce to you on SIP episode 29, six and a half months, almost seven months of, oh, seven months and a week of episodes going on since early February because shelter in place magically spelled SIP. So we decided we had to do a video to introduce and bring these winemakers into your back decks, your patios, your living rooms, your family rooms. And, and we are thrilled to be with, in the Crux tasting room, quite honestly, where I'm sitting, uh, and Brian and Steve are at some unnamed location. Uh, but they are the guys behind Crux. And we are going to introduce you to, to them tonight. So without much further ado, let's get to the good juice. And let's get to our friends, Brian and Steve from Crux Winery. So gentlemen, thank you for spending your Friday with us and cheers. Hey, glad to be here. Cheers to you and to everyone. So now Crux, we've known for quite a few years at Cellar Angels. And the thing that amazes me is the story about how this got started. Cause I believe you guys, if memory serves, you met in prison or in, I'm just, um, no, you, you were, were you neighbors? That's right. Yeah, I, uh, I moved in next door to him. Uh, so uh, we, we met by chance and uh, look how far we've come. So what, what year did you move in next door and where was next door? What, what town in the area? So <clears throat> we're in the Russian River Valley. So we're just outside of a little town called Windsor, which is kind of jammed between Santa Rosa and Healdsburg in Northern Sonoma County. Uh, and what year was this? So uh, I moved in here officially in 05, but had been in the neighborhood for a couple years before that. But okay. in 05 is when uh, I became a permanent resident 
and uh, horned in on Steve's little garage winemaking project. So Steve, he was kind of like, uh, who was the neighbor in Tim Allen's home improvement where he just kept <laughs> coming over, kept coming over? Nelson? Wilson, was what was it? That our, our home wine wasn't deadly. You know, most people kind of, you tell them you're making some wine in your garage and they kind of recoil a little bit, don't want to taste it. So. Well, see, and, and that's funny because everybody in the wine industry or certainly wine consumers that love wine recognize and appreciate the garagiste mentality and, and the, the imagery and everything be, and the history behind that, where that's where literally where the best wines in France are made are in the garages. And so, so, so Brian, you were just kind of the nosy neighbor going, Hey, what are you doing over there? What's, 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 I noticed no cars in the garage. They're always in the driveway. <laughs> yeah. I could smell the fermentation. So I, I rushed over, but uh, no, it was um, literally just, kind of a, a happenstance. Uh, we, there were about five of us that were making wine and and I won't say small quantities. I mean, we're, we weren't making carboys. We were making several barrels of wine. Um, wow. Again, too stupid to know better. Um, you know, we, we had access to fruit and lots of advice. And, you know, we, we knew from being wine drinkers that you didn't make wine in a glass jar. So we had to get barrels and fill those up and we uh, couldn't turn down an, an opportunity and, you know, especially in 05, there was a lot of fruit around. Right. So it was easy and cheap to get access to. So I think huge, we made huge vintage. seven barrels or something that year. It, it went five ways, but uh, we made a lot of wine. So, and also uh, a quick shout out to Diane Yetter. Uh, Hans Greasy, Hans, I believe, is in Colorado, recently moved from Chicago. Jeff and Jane Greasy, which are lifelong supporters of SIP. They haven't missed a single episode. Bill Best, welcome, sir, uh, in Evanston, Illinois. And just so everyone knows, and I think this is, I, I, I skipped this in the beginning, in the intro, uh, we have a new wardrobe sponsor. So that's, that's Crux. And, and also, I'd also like to introduce the talent behind the company, Denise. Uh, she is also now a proud recipient of Crux Wardrobe, which we are not taking off for the rest of this episode. <laughs> uh, but it, it, we are very easily swayed and swag does it. So we're, there's not rocket science. We aren't complicated over at Cellar Angels. So this is our wardrobe sponsor in addition to Zoetic. So we're very comfortable with this. Diane Yetter, if I didn't say hello, I thought I did say hello. Um, so 2005, you you move up to Windsor, Brian, but you also have a day job and you're in the healthcare business. You're in the healthcare business in 2005, correct? Yep. Yep. Why uh, the move? Why, years. why the move to Windsor, or thereabouts? Uh, I was chasing a woman. Say no more. Say, yeah. Say, say, say no more. Go on. <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> the best reason. <laughs> well, and she actually married me, so it it, it turned out. All well. right. I like that. That's, the, that's a great story. And then, so you bothered Steve and then you guys are all making a bunch of wine. When did the plan materialize from, okay, we, we need to get a little bit more serious about this and, and walk me through that process. Was it a spreadsheet analysis or it was like, Hey, this is a hell of a lot of fun. Let's just freaking do this. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't, uh, certainly wasn't overnight. It took us a long time. I mean, uh, our enthusiasm, uh, both of us had a lot of enthusiasm for Rhone varietals. And um, at that time, it was something we, we couldn't get our hands on too well. We, we made a lot of other things. We made Zins and Cabs and Pinots and uh, all sorts of different wines. But we had some space we wanted to plant. And we both loved uh, Rhone varietals. And we thought they would be well suited to this area. It's not as hot as the Napa site. It's not as cool as other parts of Sonoma. So um, we started planting in uh, 07 and, um, or no, 05, sorry. And, um, and then planted majority of the property in 07. Um, well, wait, let me, let me back up a sec there. Um, Steve, you were living in the area already, uh, uh -huh. born and raised or? No, nope, originally from Oregon. Oh, wow. Uh, but I've been here now for 20 years. Okay. Did you go to, uh, were you a duck? <laughs> I, I was not. I was an owl. 
an owl. <laughs> an interesting species in re naming convention they have up in Oregon. Apparently, it's, <laughs> it's all bird related. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you've been. Right. In, were you in when you moved to California? Is this specifically where you moved? Did you move to wine country, or did you were like down in San Francisco or? Yeah, we we're in the Bay Area at first. Um, my wife and I fell in love with with wine country, and um, kind of plotted to get here. I guess we kept thinking that oh, there nice. should be a way that we could get here, and um, that that's kind of been a never never regretted that decision at all. Love it up here. No, I I, I would think not. That's outstanding. And so you decided on Rhone varietals and. I'm not going to give too much away because it's a poll question later on, but why did you actually, I mean, you're in, you're in Russian river Valley, you're in Pinot, Chardonnay, you know, the Mecca, if you will, uh, for those varieties. And was there ever a thought to do those? Uh, there was a thought to do those. Um, like when, that? <laughs> you know, a lot of people that do nice job with Pinot. Um, the Russian River AVA, that's a American viticulture area, is is really it's really too large and not very specific. We're at the northern end of it, which is actually the warmest area. Um, they do grow Pinot nearby, uh, but they they it, it's it's a very warm area for Pinot Noir, so. Um, it's, it's not well suited, even though we are, you know, in an AVA that's famous for those two things. Um, I would really say that uh, our properties here in the north, north end are much better suited to Syrah and Grenache. Uh, we have a note from Facebook. Uh, there's a Lisa Gower that says, I love you, Martin. I have no idea the, the, the <laughs> reference point there. Uh, apparently, never heard, never heard of her. <laughs> Uh, we have a new Facebook fan. I know apparently because she actually is, is endorsing the move to wine country. I'm hoping that's what it's from. Uh, for the record, <laughs> I don't know Lisa. Uh, but that, I, I, it's funny because we just moved out of Chicago. We're now in South Florida. But there, it was almost a coin flip between wine country and here because you're right. It's such a magical, magical area. And, and I'm going to actually, we're going to jump to Google Earth so I can show people where you are. Uh, because I think it's important when you say we're a little bit north that people actually get an understanding of really how far north you are. And I, I don't see a couple of color. I see Hans on from Colorado. There's another group from, from uh, and, and the, the Greasy's just closed. Hans just closed on his house. So congratulations. That's reason for celebration. And Caitlin. And, but some people have actually been to your tasting room. And by the way, I'm sitting in the tasting room. So I want everyone to take a look at the tasting room because I'm going to zoom in on it in a second. Here's our big, beautiful blue orb. And we're going to go over to Crux. And it is fairly far north. It takes a while to catch up. <laughs> I'm sure there's several folks that are sitting at their home going, whoa, a little vertigo setting in. So what what I found fascinating when, when I went there to see you guys, and Denise was with me, which was awesome, because we had actually featured you before, and we had never met in person. So uh, I'll pan out a little bit so folks can actually see the remoteness of this, because you're north of Geyserville. We're, we're just north of Healdsburg. North of Healdsburg. South of Geyserville. Oh, south of Geyserville, that's right. Um, so here you can kind of see Healdsburg right here and right in here. But I mean, anybody driving here, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're here, you're here by appointment or you are wildly lost. <laughs> True. And, and I remember when we got there, we walked in the wrong door. Do you remember this, Brian? Yep. And, and I think you had, you shared, I don't know which building it is. You share a building with someone and we're like, uh, we're here to see Brian. And then he yelled over the partition and he was kind of a, a curmudgeonly, um, uh, not, nice guy, genteel would not be an adjective I'd throw out. Um, 
and, and he, was, he was kind enough to alert you to our arrival that said, hey, Brian, there's a couple people here that want to taste your battery acid. <laughs> <laughs> That's Roger. <laughs> That's Roger. So, <laughs> so this is what I love about these types of tastings. And, and greasies, when you go out there, you have to taste here. Scotland kefir, when you get out to the valley, you have to taste here. Because it's, it's not mahogany and... and and marble and fountains and it's it's you are gonna sit where I am sitting right now they they have a gorgeous you can actually tell me the story about this slab right here and you're gonna taste through the entire crux portfolio and you will spend a, an hour or more with Brian and Steve or one or the other uh, depending upon who you're fortunate enough to have and you get to walk through all of these wines but I think the room that you're in actually is kind of special and tell me a little bit about this Sure. Well, the, the facility you were looking at, we're, we're in a part of a warehouse in a, a fairly large complex. There's several wineries that have production areas there and lots of other businesses that have no relationship to wine. Um, we, we moved up there in 2014 after uh, Lisa kicked us out of their garage, which is where we made our wine for the first couple of years. But, um, and full disclosure, where you zoomed in on is our production facility, which is actually in the Alexander Valley. Our fruit and our homes and where we are right this second is about 10 minutes south of there, just on the south end of Healdsburg. Okay. So our, our, our fruit comes from, from that corner of the Russian River. And we'll talk about our name later, but that's kind of the genesis of it. Um, where we well, this room, isn't there oh, something... Oh. Yeah, the, the history of this, of this particular wall thickness and what happened in this area prior to, to your arrival. Yeah, the, the complex I was mentioning earlier has gone through a, a series of reinventions. Literally like 120 years ago, it was a hop farm um, and they grew hops, which was very common, that and prunes um, in the Healdsburg area before uh, they've torn those all out and put grapes in. But um, so it was a hop farm for a long time. And in like 1950, they converted it into a mushroom farm. So if you come on the property, there's all these little, it's a contiguous building, but it has all these little pitched roofs on it. And each of those rooms was a grow room for the mushrooms. And I guess the story was they could pick one room every day. And by the time they were done, they could start over. Um, it's kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, yep. So, the mushroom plant lasted until the mid 80s. And then, um, you know, they kind of diversified into mostly small businesses that rent parts. And um, some of those grow rooms where we actually are is the old uh, storage area, cold storage for the mushrooms after they were picked. So we're in this, we're, it's a building, a room inside of our warehouse, um, very thick walls, um, again, built, you know, in the 50s. So whatever's insulating there is probably not legal anymore, but it's, it's very effective. And uh, it hadn't been used as anything really in about 30 years when we moved in in 2014. So there was a lot of scrubbing that needed to be done to clean that place up if you imagine how clean mushrooms are. Um, well, I, and, and I think it's fascinating because I do remember the cold storage story and those walls are thick. I'm, I'm talking, you know, several feet thick. And it's fascinating that that was their insulation aspect, you know, in the 1960s and 70s with, or 50s rather for the installation of the mushrooms. And you do, you, you, it's almost like you're in a ship where you have, or a submarine where you have to like step over partitions to get into another room and, and that sort of thing, because you get deeper into this and then you're in this little tasting room or not little, I mean, there's barrels behind me. Uh, but this is, it, this is what I love about it. it it's that, okay, let, roll up the sleeves, let's taste some wine. There's, n there's no pretense. And, and that's one of the things our customers appreciate. It's just solid, solid, solid wine. And, and just the pretense is gone. It's, so let's taste wine. Let's figure out why we're here, tell some stories. And, and, I, and I love that aspect about this tasting room. I'd be curious when, when you looked at it for the first time, was the agent just basically said, boy, have I got a deal for you two? <laughs> not, not really. I, I think they were confused as to what we were going to do with it. Where I was looking at the cold storage room, going, "Hey, that we need that." Perfect. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, that's awesome. And it, and, it was and tell me about. 
Tell me about the slab that is holding the bottles. Um, well, my wife accuses me of being a bit of a, a fanatic of wood products. And so I'm always looking for bowls and platters and things like that. But um, we have a, a beautiful redwood plank on the back of a couple barrels in my backyard that we use kind of as a bar space. So when we got the winery, I was like, I gotta, I gotta find something here. So this is actually one of two pieces that were cut from the same tree. Um, so we have sort of a variable size bar. Um, it's walnut, which is um, common around here. Um, they're about six feet long, each of them, and, and you can basically butt them end to end and kind of they make this contiguous bar space, so. Very cool, big, big, big fan. Uh, and I love how the story transitioned from, I chased a woman up here to my wife accuses me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's an interesting arc. So I'm going to launch the first poll question because I want to get into the answer. And the first poll question actually talks about why you got into Rhone varieties. So the fondness for Rhone wines started by Stephen Bryan originates from a trip to Chateauneuf du Pop in the early 90s, amazement over the exceptional food friendliness of the wines and, and or no one was actually doing 100% Rhones and we love a challenge. So I'm gonna give the audience uh, a few seconds to answer this. And as I say, uh, people can put money on this. So there's some <laughs> folks that are, that are undefeated. We, we, all wagers are welcome. I'm gonna give, oh, we've got, all right, 88% voted, five, four, Three, two, one. Apparently, no one believes you to leave the state because <laughs> yeah. a trip to Chateauneuf was, is not on the cards. And an amazement over the exceptional food friendliness has 38%, but no one was doing it and we love a challenge. So, so educate us on why on earth in Pinot, Chardonnay country, and then across the valley in Cab country, you're doing rounds. Well, it's, it's pretty simple and it really just comes down to what, what our palates prefer. And, you know, Steve and I both were huge fans of Rhone varietals, be they French, Australian, Spanish, American, whatever. I mean, um, we like them because of the variety, the ability to pair with food, ability to drink them alone. Um, you know, we both traveled to go to wine places to seek those kinds of things out. Um, we made Cabernet, we made Pinot, we made Syrah, Barbera. Uh, you know, there wasn't, again, I, we, we weren't particular about any opportunity to get some fruit. Um, but we both agreed that there's so much good Pinot around. Let's not, let's not do that. You know, we can walk down to any corner, you know, winery and grab a bottle. Um, so we just, we just realized the Rhones were good, um, mixing partners for each other. And, and we just decided, uh, and I think it was probably, you know, Oh five, as we were planning out the vineyards, we just, we, we planted small blocks. We grow six different varietals, five different varietals. Um, and the only one that's not a Rhone is a Zinfandel. We just, we love Rhone, Russian river Zinfandel. Um, well, so, and, and then you just, mentioned something where you own the vineyard block. So you guys bought land to plant? It wasn't intentional necessarily that we ended up with land, but you know, we did have extra and we're, we're living amongst a lot of vines and uh, it seemed like a cool thing to do. I mean, when we so planted the vines, we, we had no idea we were going to be in the wine business. Um, and really, it, it, it was not a long drawn out plan. We decided at the end of the 2011 harvest that we should give it a go. And we, our first commercial vintage was in 2012. So, right, so planning then, and spreadsheets, those are all very foreign things uh, on the most, for the most part. Um, clearly we didn't have any sound financial advice about getting into the wine business, but it, it was not a, a lifelong dream or a planned event. It was more of a spur of the moment we, we loved making wine, we were growing it, we were realizing we, we planted a, an awful lot of fruit for our, uh, you know, family consumption. Um, so basically, you know, back to the wives story is, 
you know, they, they were just shaking their heads thinking, you idiots, you know, you've invested all this money and time and, and now what are you going to do with it? So, you know, we, that's a, that's a trait I think wives share. Yeah. <laughs> we started talking, you know, well, you know, what, what do we do? And at, at the end of 11, we were, we were, you know, only a couple year farmers. We, we picked the first fruit off our vines just a year or two before that. It was a really tough summer. Um, not, not the kind of summer we're having this year, but it was cool. The mid, you know, median temperatures was in the 70s when it's usually in the 90s in July. We got late, rain late in the spring and early in the fall. So everything was an issue. Um, you know, we were picking Steve's Syrah block and it took us three times longer than it usually does. And it rained five inches on our heads that day. So we'd have to pick into these lugs and take them into the shop and dump the rainwater out before doing anything with the grapes. It, it was miserable. And it was kind of at the end of that, we looked at each other and said, well, you know, would you rather be doing this or, you know, been in a meeting somewhere? And we both pretty quickly said, this is Me pretty cool meeting? still. Probably the pretty worst pretty day in the vineyard at the time. So it, it's one of those things where the worst day in the vineyard is still better than a good day in the office type of thing. Yeah. Yep. I totally, I, I mean, I applaud the courage, uh, I don't know, moxie, the, the, the tenacity to just say, okay, well, we, we have a vineyard, we planted it. And, and so essentially the Rhones just stuck out with you because of the food friendliness and just how approachable they were. Yep. And it wasn't like you had an epiphany where you had a Grenache one day and said, dear Lord, this is fantastic. What is this? It was just, you had, had enough exposure to the Rhones to where, this seems to be pr pretty, pretty versatile. I, I like these wines. Right. Yeah, we just I gravitated towards them based on experience. I, I went to school down in San Luis Obispo, so not far from Paso Robles. Um, and, you know, so cheap date, take, take somebody out and go wine tasting. Or, you know, we were just exposed to a lot of wine in that environment. And uh, they, they do a lot of rones down there. Uh, cheap date. Uh, please direct all the calls to Steve and Brian for uh, <laughs> cheap date comments. So let's talk about what we're tasting tonight because it is a, a Rhone blend. And you had the bottle earlier. I've got the bottle here. Uh, it is the Crux 2016 GSM. And I would bet a lot of money that most of our people on right now know what a GSM is. But, but walk us through GSM. Okay, a GSM is a Grenache Syrah Mavedra blend. Um, historically, that um, would be a Southern Rhone wine, a Chateauneuf du Pape, a Cote de Rhone. Those are, are GSM wines. Um, here in California, we name everything after its varietal. So while those wines are GSMs, they're named after the place. Um, uh, anyway, that, that's a traditional home for a GSM. Um, as a uh, as for the wine, it's um, I think it's kind of a middleweight wine um, in my mind. Um, expands upon what the aromatics of of Grenache adds a little Syrah and Mavedra for a, a little more heft, um, but you still end up with kind of a, a middleweight wine that pairs broadly with a lot of food. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's awesome. It's, I like your phrase of the, or your use of the phrase middleweight. It's not dominant. It's not a heavyweight, you know, slug fest of fruit or anything like that. It's, um, it has great fruit on it, but it also has a, a, a lot of depth to it. And, and just, and I can see to your point, Steve, I can see this pairing with a ton of different foods. Yeah, that's, that's kind of our, our pitch to restaurants is that it, you know, people at a table, they don't order the same dish. They, uh, they go for the variety. So this is just about as versatile as you can get as far as covering a lot of ground, different types of food. Have either of you ever had octopus hot dogs? <laughs> I have not. Okay. Um, I just was curious if it would pair with that. And, and Jeff, you may want to get this out of the hands of your grandkids if that's what they're eating, but uh, it, it's awesome. And, and talk to me about 2016, because you're right. I mean, when you got started in 05, killer vintage, everything went right, uh, everything, you know, it just seems like the odd years, 07, 09, well, 11 was actually kind of tough. Um, but what was 16 like? Uh, 16 was uh, late in our, our string of drought years we had here, really starting with 12 
all the way through 16 were, were very warm years. Um, you know, sometimes uh, in the wine, I sort of get that dry earth uh, aromatics to it. I, I think it I think it reflects the the string of dry seasons we had there. Um, in some ways, uh, drought years are kind of easy from a, a viticulture perspective. Um, not a lot of rain um, threatening or anything like that. Uh, they tend to be a little bit earlier. So um, I guess the, the flip side is, is, is it does make a little more robust, richer wine. Um, whether that's to your liking or not is, you know, a personal decision. But um, um, as far as the GSM goes, what, what, what we'll tend to do is maybe use a little less Syrah, uh, a little more Grenache in a year like that, because um, like, you know, we want to keep that, that balance to the wine where the Syrah can get really rich and powerful in a, in a dry season like that. So like I say, we want to keep the, keep it balanced, keep it a middleweight that make a bruiser out of it. Well, you, you did a fantastic job. And I think it's interesting when we used to own a wine store in, in Chicago, we would love to get people into the Rhones and, and it was, it's such a epiphany light bulb moment because they, they get hit with the big sticks, you know, the cabs, Pinot Merlot, Chardonnay, Sav Blanc, Riesling, but they don't venture outside their, their comfort zone too often. But if you could get them to do that, you see, you see the light bulbs go off of appreciation and enjoyment and the smiles creep across the face. And then they realize, wow, this is a fraction of the cost of a, of a Napa cab. And, <laughs> and it's, it's really enjoyable. So, I think that GSM blending aspect has got to be probably maddening, but also invigorating. So when you are doing the blending, how do the two of you do that? How, how do you determine, all right, we're going to do, do a pinch more Syrah or, or less Mouved? I mean, what walk us through kind of that. <laughs> I'm sure it's all spreadsheeted out. Uh, well, <laughs> yes and no. Um, well, we, we really keep keep it to the two of us. Um, we don't want to dumb it down too much by having, you know, an average of opinions. We don't want things to be averaged out. You know, we want it to be uh, really between us. Um, we'll start with, um, you know, maybe a blend that we've gone with before and then maybe try to establish the extremes. Um, you know, too much of something basically uh, kind of bookend it. Okay. And uh, kind of back into it. At some point, um, uh, we'll write on the bottom of our glasses what the blends are and mix them all up and come back at it blind. Because it's, it's amazing what, what prejudice you can put into things. If, if, you, if you have an idea of what you think is going to work, it will always work. Um, that's where uh, blind tasting really um, makes a lot more sense. because yeah, it, cog uh, Cognitive bias is strong. It's very strong. Uh, yeah, we, we've made it a practice also to come back and double check our work because sometimes by the end of a lot of blending, um, you're you're less receptive to what you should be paying attention to. Well, uh, the, the other thing I was going to say. Go ahead. I want to say hello to Andrea Sargas and Jody Rubin on Facebook. So I apologize, Brian. Go ahead. It was just to say. I mean, for a small winery, we do about a thousand to twelve hundred cases a year. Um, so very small. And at, at one point, one vintage, we made 10 different wines. So you, you understand the production levels of those are, are very small. Um, we've simplified a little bit. We only make eight now. Uh, and, um, but our GSM is kind of in the middle of, of our flight of reds. We make five different red wines. Um, well, while, while, you're talking, while you're talking about the portfolio, walk us through kind of the, the whole portfolio, the eight wines that you're making. And Kara Fernandez on Facebook, hello. Uh, so like this portfolio behind me, walk us through kind of the eight stalwarts that will be in the portfolio. Sure. Well, uh, we have two Rhone whites. Um, one is a Grenache Blanc, um, super crisp acid, um, you know, green apple flavors, a lot of minerality. Uh, we also, we, we usually blend with a little bit of Viognier in it just to temper some of the acid a little bit. And um, Viognier adds kind of a, a level of unctuousness or um, just texture that, that the Grenache Blanc really appreciates. 
And then we have a Viognier, which coincidentally has a little bit of Grenache Blanc in it just to help with a, a small acid kick. Um, you know, and that's the, you know, kind of the red wine drinkers, white wine. It's more of a full bodied wine, um, more pear and apple and honey kind of thing. So um, much richer than the Grenache Blanc. So they're a good balance. Interesting. And then I see a, I see a, a, a rosé behind me. Yeah, we do a, a rosé that's actually a GSM. Um, it, uh, it's a series of, uh, we, we call them bleed offs. Uh, basically, we pull juice from our red wine fermentation um, early on so they don't have much color. Uh, we pull a little bit of juice off and basically assemble that, assemble that rosé uh, over time. Um, the, the GS and the M don't come in at the same time. So um, typically they're fermented separately and blended back together later. So let, let me, I have two questions because that's the bleed off process to me is, is still foreign and, and fascinating. But when you talk about the Grenache Blanc, Grenache Blanc is a certain variety, yes? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think of it like Pinot. You have Pinot Noir and it's technically Grenache Noir is the red grape. And Grenache Blanc is like Pinot Blanc. So related uh, in the family, but totally different grapes. A white grape and a red grape. And then, and then the bleed off process, how does that work? You, you have the grapes uh, in the tank and then is there, do you like set a watch and say, okay, we've got a, I mean, how, how on earth does that happen? Kind of, uh, kind of like that actually. Um, it, well, it's, it's different for each, each of the different varietals. Um, Syrah picks up color very quickly. Um, it, uh, it, we have to hurry actually, right after we destem the fruit, we basically take the juice off or it'll, it'll be red in no time. Um, right. Grenache is the opposite extreme. Um, it kind of looks like dirty water at first. <laughs> you have to let it sit and get a little bit of color um, to even appear pink. It, it'll look a little orange at first. Um, so, um, the Grenache will be on the skins for a matter of hours, um, Syrah, a matter of minutes. So, interesting. Uh, yeah, and Mavedra is like in, in between. So, and, and what's your flavor profile description of Muved? It It's the hardest uh, one to describe. <laughs> I, I've said before that I, I hate that question. Um, it, um, I asked him to ask it. Did you? I believe it. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of a, a spice rack wine, you know. It's 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 influential in the blend. It um, it has some like classic old world flavors, um, earthiness um, and depth. Um, here's here's how I describe Muved: <laughs> dirty velour. <laughs> okay. Because if because everyone that's old enough remembers the velour shorts of the '80s, which when we all thought we were cool, it was like kind of soft and, and velvety. Um, mm -hmm. but Mouved has that that velvet type of uh, component to it, but you're right about the earthiness. Where it's just like, wow, this is a powerful, pungent is kind of strong, but it, it, it's and and I, I like the spice rack at uh, way you described it because when I've seen blends over the years and it's you know 78 this 21 that and one percent move in and you're like really one percent <laughs> what happened there it's like you have no idea how powerful move that is and it's like okay now i get it because it is that kind of that that um equalizer if you will but but it is a very difficult grape it is it it's difficult in a lot of ways it's very difficult to grow uh it's got a lot to do with i think that has a lot to do with why it's not terribly popular is that a lot of growers just don't want to plant it. It, it needs, it, it's very finicky, likes a very long season, not too hot, not too cold, just long. Um, it, uh, it can just take, I mean, it, we have, it, it's the last block on my property is the, the tiny amount of Mavedra we have. Um, it's, I don't know, but we, I think we've picked it in November before. It can be ridiculous. <laughs> Bill Best uh, in Evanston, uh, I can have you removed from the chat room for saying velour was never cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently well, I'm so not... we're, now we're into the reds. Right. And, and 
And so we were talking about the GSM. So when, when we're blending our GSM, the I guess we kind of have safety nets or um, whatnot, but we have Grenache and Syrah that we make on either side of it. So when we're blending, we have to keep those wines in perspective. Um, so I, I guess we have the luxury. It makes our job really easy. We, you know, the Grenache is a Grenache, the Syrah is a Syrah, although we do a little blending with both of those. But the GSM just has to be in the middle of that. And it, it it's, it's really hard to go wrong. I mean, we just have great fruit and, and blending it is pretty easy. We're just trying to, to make the best based on what we're tasting and smelling. And um, so those three are the, the, the um, you know, lighter to mid range reds. And then we've got a Petite Syrah and a Zinfandel. Um, it's an estate Zin um, just cause we grow it and we love a, like a cooler climate Zinfandel versus some of the things you get up in Dry Creek that are, you know, super jammy heavy alcohol. It's just, just not our style. Well, and, and then where did you source and get the, the clones from for the Zinn? Because you're right, you've got that Dry Creek, you've got Bradford Mountain, you've got Rock Pile, you've got all these great alleged Zinn production AVAs type of stuff or, or areas. How did you decide on, on what you wanted to plant from a Zinn stand, standpoint? Um, you know, it's, it's surprising. I mean, that's one of the interesting things about where we are is um, while Russian River, you don't think necessarily think of it for Zinfandel. I mean, it's it's not even a mile as the crow flies to the Dry Creek Valley from our property. We're we're really in an area that's close to every AVA, um, and um, uh, we're not that far out. I mean, we didn't really make any special effort to plant an early ripening Zin or anything like that. We used a typical um, clone available at the time. And we, we usually never have any issue with ripening of Zen at all. Um, it's you. perfectly happy here. The, the explosion of rosés is not lost on you because you obviously you have one. And, and I'm curious, it's a GSM rosé, but have you ever thought about expanding the rosé offering or have you made a, a, a side project of, you know, we're going to make a rosé of Syrah. We're going to make a rosé of Zin just for, for fun or for, for commercial? Mm. Commercially, we haven't done that. We did it all the time in the garage. We made Cabernet rosé, Syrah rosé, Zin rosé. Things that, things that do not belong <laughs> like rosés. We, we tried to do a petite Syrah. We tried to do a petite Syrah, but it just came out red. So it, yeah. that didn't work. I love it. And, and the, so I, I, I mean, the Syrah you've made and I've had it is like off the charts. And is that a, when you guys hit these home runs, cause you hit a lot of them, do you look at each other and just pinch yourself or, or is it just like, ah, a relaxing, you know, exhalation of just pure satisfaction. Share a little bit about that triumphant, uh, experience. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's not always that obvious. <laughs> I hate to say that. I, 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 I'd love it to say that we we're done blending. We high five each other, knowing it's perfect. Um, right, nailed doesn't it. Doesn't always doesn't always work that way, as, especially with Grenache. Um, it can close down after going in the bottle and and frustrate us to death. You know right before release it comes back to life or something like that we've had years like that so uh i don't think we're ever that certain of a slam dunk um yeah um, we're full of self-doubt so <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line well is, there's a, a semi-interesting story about uh our grenache and our gsm in 2013 so that was our second year as a you know a commercial label and you know we were kind of mesmerized and and deer in headlights with our first release which was from 2012 so by 2013 we're like okay now we're not rookies anymore we can really appreciate this we're not rookies anymore before again we, 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 we we're not critical thinkers right. uh, we've had one year in our belt we're veterans we need right. some some yeah. uh, in there done that anyway so we we release our grenache base wines in the spring and then pretty much everything else in the fall so we were, we were about to release the 13 Grenache and GSM. So I was like, I mean, we hadn't, they were almost in the bottle for a year, um, maybe 10 months. And we hadn't had a bottle in a long time. So it was literally like two weeks before we were gonna 
you know, present them at our release party and pour them for people and sell them to people. Uh, we cracked a couple bottles and I was, I, they were terrible, horrible, horrible. I was like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to sell this shit. Excuse my French, but. Um, okay. There's only like four people it's, and this is not syndicated, so. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was totally alarming. We were like, holy cow. You know, and we opened another set of bottles because we, we were mystified. It just, it was just funky as all get out. It, it, um, mm -hmm. it just smelled off. It didn't have a lot of taste to it. Um, I literally was, you know, thinking, what the hell did we get into? Um, but I swear to God, over those two weeks, a miracle happened and the wines just came right back. So we've kind of decided now that we're going to try to bottle age things for about a year before we release them just, just because of that situation. But it, the 13 still drinking great. So again, I don't know, beginner's luck or self doubt or whatever, but um, it, it was a scary moment, probably the most scary moment I've had in the wine business until yeah. this year. With the, I, with the I, I can imagine that. I, I would love to see the two looks on your faces where you're looking at each other going, Holy dear God, this is horrible. You, what have we done? And then having to, you know, leave the garage and leave the, the tasting room and, and explain to the wives, yeah, this, this hasn't panned out as much as we thought it was going to pan out. <laughs> well, I brought him home. I'm like, here, Heidi, try this. She has a better problem um, than I do. For those of you just joining us, and I think I said hello to Diane Yetter and Julie Fogarty, uh, it's wardrobe time. It's Crux Winery, our newest wardrobe sponsor. And for all future <laughs> there's actually the talent behind everything. Uh, why Crux? Where did that name come from? Well, I, I think I alluded to the fact that we're very close to several other AVAs here in, in the area. And um, we really wanted to come up with a name that sort of suggested that uh, intersection of AVAs and, and that's uh, Crux as a, a crossroads of things. Uh, a friend of ours actually thought of that for us, um, kind of based on that uh, idea. And um, so. Yeah, we've been talking about it for months and trying to come up with a name and we had this whole story behind it and we couldn't come up with it. And 10 seconds with a friend, she goes, what about Crux? Like, so what, what are the AVAs that are, are converging? Uh, the Russian River Valley, obviously that's where we are. Uh, but the uh, Dry Creek AVA, Alexander Valley, Chalk Hill, and um, we're, we're not even that far from uh, Sonoma Coast, actually. Right, so you've got four or five different AVAs kind of right there. Right. And, and when it's not your estate vineyard, how do you determine the fruit that you're going to source? Well, we, um, we, we want it to be similar to ours. So all, all of our sources are very close to us. Um, I guess for a couple of reasons, we're, we're lazy. We don't want to have to go very far. And uh, do, we want it to be like ours. We want to, we understand at least, at least we're trying to understand our, our own vineyards and, and the, the climate that is right here. And it's, it's one thing that's very interesting about Sonoma uh, is you, you can travel, you know, we'll go to the winery, like Brian said, 10 minutes away, it's five degrees hotter up there. Um, totally different set of grapes are being grown up that direction. So um, anyway. Um, Again, we're, we were based on the reasons we planted what we planted here at our homes, you know, bring in that same kind of fruit, same farming practices, you know, same topography, same climate, you know, it, we're really just adding more of our own uh, to what we have in the winery. It's not like we're trying to blend four different distinct but Pinot Noirs from different places. Right. We want this to be about the Rhone and, and the middle reach of the Rhone, which is, you know, where we think and, and where all those places come together. I like it. And before I launch into our final poll question, I'm going to try to figure out if I can do something here and here so people can actually see what we're drinking. Because, uh, and also if those of you in the chat, I, I know there's a bunch of people talking right now about um, locations 
and but I would really want to get some feedback on the GSM because the, the bottle's beautiful. Uh, here's the Cellar Angels website. You can always get the SIP tasting kit, which is going to get you the next six wines in a row for the next six Fridays. And, and let's be honest, we aren't going anywhere on Fridays because this thing has not turned the corner. Uh, so shelter in place is, is going to be here for the fall. As a matter of fact, Cellar Angels has actually booked all throughout the entire rest of the year for Friday night events. So date night is official. Uh, <laughs> but the GSM is right here. And we have a new charity, if you will, uh, from a disaster relief standpoint. So I would love for people, if you want to help the wineries in Napa and Sonoma, please do so. You can purchase direct from Cellar Angels. You can purchase direct from, this, from the wineries. And it's really just click on disaster relief. And it is actually supporting the victims that have been evacuated in wine country. Uh, but this is the Cellar Angels website, pretty user friendly. And the Crux wine is available right now. Brian and, and, and Steve have been amazing. We're not going anywhere just yet uh, because I've got another poll question. And, and this is the one for all the marbles. So put your appetizers down, wipe off your fingers. There was a hint earlier, uh, unknowingly, Steve, if you were paying attention at home, divulge a little bit of this answer. <laughs> In the Northern Rhone, red wine grapes are often vinified with a specific white wine grape. Which one? Viognier, Sauvignon Blanc, or the decadently obscure Picardin. I'm leaning towards Picardin. <laughs> wow, we've got a very smart audience this evening. Apparently they are paying attention to Steve. Uh, this is actually good for us because I'm gonna end it in five, four, three, two. Let me see, we've got 88% of the vote in. Look at these bad boys. Wow. <laughs> which is a good news, bad news situation because all of the money now rolls over to next week. So there, <laughs> there is no clear winner. Um, so I think it is interesting, you know, cause we learned about this years and years ago and it's fascinating when you do taste Syrah and, and you learn that it's actually cut with a little bit of Viognier. And, and Steve, you mentioned it earlier, why do that and, and, and what's the benefit and, and how do you determine the ratios? Hmm. Well, interesting. We don't often do that. Um, although today we just pressed <laughs> a Syrah with uh, probably about 10% Viognier in it. Um, it's the first time we've ever co-fermented them. Yeah. And we, blended I, them. We, we knew that because the production team upstairs in the studio told me that that had happened, which is why the question surfaced. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, it's, I, I think that the concept is, is air, aromatics and color stability in France. Now we don't, we don't have color stability to deal with here. Um, we got pretty good aromatics. We have pretty good aromatics. Um, this year, um, it was a rare situation here where we were able to hold some VNA off long enough to go in with Syrah. Um, I tried it early on um, during the, the drought years and the VNA was dried up little raisins by the time the Syrah was ready. So um, we, we decided that adjacent vineyards, it's pretty tough to do that because just, you know, there, there's a month difference between those harvest dates. So it's awfully hard to, to do it here. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. So I, I assume in France where they do it on a common commonplace, they have, vineyards that face north or something with VNA and you know exposed hillsides facing south with the Syrah and that that works it out for them but uh, we didn't really have that option here um, but kind of interesting um, this year we did a, a small lot that way and um, I'm not sure if we're going to keep it separate forever <laughs> or if it's going to go into the the main uh, Syrah that we bottle or, or exactly what so is that a decision is that a decision that's made between the two of you or is that a decision that's made? Heck, he's not even here. I'm going to co-ferment these. <laughs> we each take liberties in that way, I think. But, you know, it's a two-man operation. So if I vote against him, you know, we're in a, a, a tie. So right. sometimes right. it's easier just making the decision and 
either hope he doesn't find out or hope it comes out well. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're calling him on the way home. You're like, hey, funny story. Um, so <laughs> this, this happened today. Well, if I had been telling the story about the Viognier and why it ended up with the Syrah, I would have said Steve forgot to pick it when we picked our other Viognier. But I didn't answer that question. Nope. And, and yeah, you can always say full disclosure. Uh, but I think it's, I mean, when I, I love tasting co-fermented Syrah and Viognier because it's such a distinct difference. And it's, it's fascinating when you have, I mean, Syrah can be a juggernaut. We, we, we're, you know, sticking with the boxing references. You've got that heavyweight. Viognier is like a, a middleweight, bantamweight, welterweight, a little lesser class, but can be very, very uh, individually, stylistically, and it just adds to it. But it's so funny when you think about a powerful red wine and then this white wine, and yet they've been doing it for hundreds of years in the room. Mm -hmm. No, that's not a hum. That's for you guys <laughs> to like expand. You know, this is a live show. <laughs> yes. Yes, answers are not good for television. <laughs> well, we have Facebook radio, so. Yeah. True. Um, so, so you mentioned 1,100 case production or so, give or take, yield-wise, depending upon the year. Uh, what's the future? You know, walk us through the two, three, because I'm sure you, like, you, you have a fondness for spreadsheets and forecasting. <laughs> so I'm sure this has been all forecasted out. As consultants, you, you, you've gotten into the details. What does two, three, five years look like? We haven't really changed our ultimate goal, really. It, it's just elongated as we've come to learn the wine business. It, it's funny how interesting it was or how easy it was to give away wine when we're making it in the garage. As soon as someone has to pay for it, you, you get a slightly different reaction. So I didn't quite figure that into whatever planning we did. Right. Um, anyway, so again, we're, we're not looking for to land on grocery, grocery store shelves anywhere. Um, kind of our whole premise going in, we wanted it to be a two-man operation. We both have dealt with employees in our day, life, day jobs. Um, and, you know, we, we wanted it to scale to the point where we thought we could do it. Although the longer it takes, the less we can do. Um, you know, we want to get to about 4,000 cases ultimately. We're a direct-to-consumer model. So we have a wine club. Um, we sell mostly to people we taste. That's how we like to sell our wines. Um, we're light on the, you know, entries of wine into to scoring events and things like that. I mean, our wines are more complex and really don't stand out in a in a tasting sometimes. Although we've had some pretty good luck, we just we just want to keep doing what we're doing. Um, you know, continuing to source the same fruit we've been sourcing and growing what we've been growing, making a little bit more of it. Um, and get to that point when we can uh, kiss the day job goodbye. Well, I, I mean, I think it's interesting too. And uh, hello, uh, Heidi Adler on Facebook. Thanks so much for joining this evening. Because now th the vines are getting older. So are you seeing kind of a, a, a mature might be kind of strong because they're only Yeah, eight, there's a progression. Years. Absolutely. It, it, okay. And, um, and that's kind of having an impact on the wines because they're getting a little bit more concentrated, a little bit more nuanced or... What, well, yeah, I mean, we, we contribute about 20% of the fruit that goes into our wine. So, um, you know, from a blended standpoint, um, you know, I, I don't, they are, um, again, um, maturing and getting more, as they get established, they start to be a little more uneven. They're, they're very um, more even now in terms of when they go through veration and how quickly they, uh, um, you know, ripen up. So it's, it's more homogenous, which is a good thing, right. um, you know, versus counterbalancing dried fruit and underripe fruit. I mean, that's not necessarily a, a way to get something in the middle. Um, so, you know, again, we're, we're not hoping to, to land on the front page of Wine Spectator. It's, it's really, we just want to make wine and drink wine with people who enjoy our wines. Well, I, I appreciate you not wanting to be on the front page of a, a trade rag that's been around for 40 years. However, you have garnered quite a few points lately. Uh, so someone's noticing. <laughs> no, it's, it, we love that. And, you know, it's, that's the challenge as a consumer of wine is, you know, do you want to rely on someone else's palate versus tasting for yourself? I mean, I have a cellar full of wines that I bought 
you know, when, when I wasn't as confident in my own palette and went more based on scores or things like that, that I, I just don't want them anymore. I mean, they're, they're not what I love. Um, right. So, you know. And how much of your fruit is in right now for 2020? All but two small blocks. Great. We have a little bit of Grenache and a little bit of Movedra here on the, the home ranch. And, and that's probably and coming off on Sunday. Anything, I mean, 2020 is a um, crazy freaking year. Uh, I think yeah. might be an understatement. Uh, Mother Nature just basically is, has said, hold my beer like 10 times this year uh, to, to try to throw a curveball. But wh how are you seeing the vintage shape up as far as uh, fruit, as far as everything, rain, ripeness? What's it, what's it point end? It's interesting. Um, if, if not for the smoke, we'd be we'd be talking about what a fantastic vintage this is. Um, you know that the, the the smoke doesn't affect how the fruit looks in any sort of way. It doesn't affect its uh, the chemistry that we normally look at. Um, it's been phenomenal. Um, it's, it's ripe, not too ripe. Uh, good acidity, something we often struggle with in California. Um, all of that has been fantastic. Uh, the big question mark is is smoke. Um, virtually, virtually everything that we have in has at least been exposed at some level to smoke. I mean, just just today. I mean, there were there was uh, some smoke in the area. So um, you know, we have the ability these days to do lab analysis to detect compounds from smoke. Um, clear down to like you know. 0.5 parts per billion. What we're, what we lack is an understanding of what that means. Um, I think um, most people agree that you can't taste a half a part per billion of smoke uh, in in a wine. Um, we're, we're we're professionals, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the question really becomes what what is the sensory threshold? Um, in most cases. Um, we really didn't have enough data at picking time to, to make a decision to pick or not. So we pretty much are bringing all of the fruit that we had planned to bring in is coming in. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a long-term discussion about is it impacted? Is it not impacted? Um, is it going to show up later? We, we really haven't tasted anything so far in a raw young wine that isn't really ready for consumption anyway. We haven't said, oh, this is, this is damaged by smoke. We haven't had that experience happily. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't later. So, so uh, you know, jury's out. Well, and, 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 you're, and you're right, and you're at least far enough away and far enough north that it's not as predominant an issue as it has been in a whole bunch of other regions. But still, like you said, it's, it's in the air and you can smell it. And you can see it. So, what type of impact does does it have on the wine? And that's all going to be decided molecularly and and through scientific analysis and, and the parts per billion that you that you reference. How does someone actually come out and taste with you guys? Very easy. Um, we we are by appointment. Um, Steve and I both have day jobs, but with a little bit of advance notice, we can uh, usually squeeze anybody in you'll have a very similar or the same experience that Denise and Martin had. Um, first, you got to find us. Second, you got to come in the right door. And if you get in the right door, we'll, we'll waive your, your uh, tasting fee. Uh, and as long as you drop cellar angels as a, uh, a way you've met us or learned about us. Um, so free tastings for those of you who come by. Um, we're, we're in the barrel room slash mushroom, uh, Cold story. We usually are tasting all of our wines that are available. At the, so it could be up to eight and maybe we'll pull something out of the library if you have a specific interest or whatnot. Um, our, our best calling card for people is having them taste our wines. That's how what we like about the whole process. Um, and, you know, you, you were asking earlier, Martin, about, you know, the high fiving and Honestly, it's, it's usually when we're with other people and they taste through the lineup and they say, geez, it was not a bad wine in this lineup. And, and we hear that a lot. And, and, you know, maybe it's cliche, I don't know, but um, it, it just, 
I mean, it really affirms kind of what we're doing and why we're taking the the extra steps and, you know, and um, trying to be as consistent and, and as quality driven as possible. Well, so, I, I think you, you've, you've hit it um, to continue with baseball analogies. You're knocking the cover off the ball. And I'm interested in the whole sustainable aspect, but we never once talked about food pairings and give me a, a 30 second kind of these are can't miss culinary pairings with your wines because I can think of about a half a dozen. <laughs> um, but, I, but I'm curious. Right. Since well, you guys I mean, are... the whites, whites, whites are a crisp acidity, so they're great with spicy food, fish, um, you know, salads. Um, the rosé is pretty ubiquitous. Um, you know, it, it, it goes with anything. We're, we're having a, a harvest lunch at one of our favorite restaurants in town with an, a few of our uh, best club members, and we're pairing that with a charcuterie. So it's uh, cornichon and, you know, prosciutto and salumi and mustards and things like that. It, and it, it can absorb all of those, you know, large range of, of flavors. What's, what's the restaurant? Uh, it's called Valette. Oh, big fan of Valette. Big, big, big fan of Valette. Uh, for the record, they're not a wardrobe sponsor, though. Um, <laughs> we'll mention it to this. Please, yes. He'll uh, probably no. give you one of those hats. I, I'd be a big fan. Uh, no, that's awesome because you're right. The charcuterie side of things works fantastic. And uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, again, give you guys a shout out for spending some of your Friday night with us because I know it's a busy, busy, busy time of year. You still have fruit on the vine. You're bringing it in. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, and I, I would like you both to stay pretty freaking healthy. So, you know, don't go anywhere because your wines are fantastic. And I hope that we can do this in person soon. And for all the cellar angels out there, this is what it's all about. You're looking at two individuals that basically rolled up their sleeves. Uh, one person was trespassing in the other person's garage and decided that we should make a business out of this. And, and this is what you get. So this is- well, I thought this was a non not profit, non-profit. Exactly. So, I didn't know we were starting a 5013C. This is a, this is a not-profit venture. But um, it, it's it's not, it's just, your purchases are not tax deductible. I'm sorry. They are not. They are not. Uh, but definitely, I would love everyone to just go to either the Cellar Angel site, go to the Crux site, buy some wine. Uh, on our site, you can pick the disaster. What is it? What is it? Disaster. disaster relief. Thank you. Jeez, everyone's yelling at me. Stop it. Um, <laughs> Disaster relief, because they've had a very, very difficult time over the last five years and this year notwithstanding. So this is a, a, a pursuit born out of passion. I, I commend you guys for, for doing what you're doing because the fruit is amazing. The wine is spectacular. I've already seen a lot of people talking about this, this GSM as just off the charts. So that's good. Uh, next week, I want to let everybody know we're going to have Tara Valentine. For those of you that are in the wine club, they were our Q3 wine club special guest, Sam Baxter. And we also have a very, very special guest who I cannot disclose, but you're going to want to be involved in this. Uh, Steve, Brian, you guys are outstanding. Stay healthy. Uh, give hugs to the wives because they're the geniuses behind this whole operation. That's and um, thank you so much and have a great, great weekend. You guys thank are awesome. You. Martin, Denise, and Ivy, thank you very much for having us and for all the great things that you're doing for the communities and for small wineries like us. And thanks everyone who joined. Um, we would love to welcome you into the winery. And again, just mention Cellar Angels and uh, you're, uh, you get a free flight. <laughs> you're too kind. Cheers, you guys. Be good.